level and really making an impact for people. Okay, so as I told you, I talk about childhood and adult obesity, and uh, it's always appropriate to do this right after you've had lunch. So let's dive into this. So most importantly, obesity is measured by the BMI, the body mass index, which is uh, weight divided by, um, weight in kilograms divided by height in meters squared. We categorize any adult with a BMI over 25 as overweight, a BMI over 30 as obese, and then the extremely obese is a BMI greater than 40. Now, you must know that the prevalence of obesity in America has just skyrocketed, and it's just an incredible public health problem. And for those of you who have not seen the CDC presentation on the prevalence rising of obesity in the United States over the last three or four decades, it's worth um, getting a copy of that and using it for any public health initiatives in your community, because it's just a staggering um, story about what's going on. Uh, you've talked about this a bit, or will, in community medicine. The, the story about obesity management is all about calories in, uh, calories out. And there's all sorts of different ways to approach this. One of the key issues is physical activity. As we've become more dependent on automobiles, less safe neighborhoods, people aren't out as much, et cetera. Uh, we know that the perspective about physical activity has changed. Many years ago, where there was this whole Canadian task force and fitness thing. We were all having people do sit-ups and pull-ups and chin-ups. Now we're talking more about physical fitness and just engaging in sport. Um, and uh, just being healthy and enjoying it. The whole idea of play for children is a concept that we have lost somewhere along the way, and maybe we should think about getting kids to enjoy being playful again. Now, a pound of fat weighs, is the same as 3,500 calories. So that means if you reduce your calorie intake by 500 calories a day, within one week you can lose one pound. The trouble is that uh, a lot of the short-term results for a myriad of things are encouraging, but the long-term results at 12 to 24 months are very, very discouraging. This, of course, is big business. There's something like 52 billion spent in direct costs related to obesity and 51 in indirect costs, 51 billion. So this is obviously big business, and you know that from all the promotions and ads. Now, the, I will discuss briefly some of the drugs available for the treatment of obesity, but I'll tell you they all have a very uh, similar and short story. They have multiple side effects, they're fairly costly, the benefits are relatively modest, such as five to 10 pound weight loss documented, and uh, the success rate long term is almost negligible. So there's really no magic in any of the um, drugs used for obesity, despite what the promotions will tell you. And having said that, of course, I have used them for that desperately pleading person who will do anything to get a little bit of help started along the way. But the long-term story and success with the drug management is, is not uh, helpful. This slide is an uh, amazing sort of thing just for your information. It talks about how the food industry and our portions have really led to this, this one of the key elements in this crisis. You can see that a bagel, if we just pick a bagel 20 years ago, uh, a, a, it was typically 140 calories. And you remember those, Lenders bagels. They were the common bagels available in the freezer of your local grocery store. They were about this big around, and that was what a bagel was. Now if you got a bagel that big, you'd feel like you got ripped off, right? They're three times larger and twice as thick, and that's what you expect. That's what portion creep has done. Every item listed here has had an incredibly profound portion creep. Pick chocolate chip cookies. You remember uh, 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 the chocolate chip ones in the package, little Chips Ahoy, Chips Ahoy, classic Chips Ahoy, probably 55 calories. They still do make those Chips Ahoy, but when you want a chocolate chip cookie at any place, like a fine hotel or we're shopping at the mall, you get the large economy size that's 275 calories. So that's a big, um, big issue. Of interest, about two or three years ago, as the epidemic was on the rise and people were uh, expressing more interest in it, there was a smattering of articles in the regular press about the food industry and how they were to blame uh, for all of this. You've been to restaurants, you know the portions are enough for three people. 
Um, but that was quickly squashed because, again, the food industry, key business, didn't want people to be negative about their industry, so that was quickly squashed. So now there is not as much public outrage about this. We just keep eating and enjoying it. Uh, this is the other drug, Orlistat, again, now over the counter, available at your local big box store so that anybody can purchase it. But again, look at this, five, two and a half kilos, five pounds more weight loss than placebo. Any idea how much you pay for that five pounds? A lot of money over a year. So the big industry now that has developed because of this is surgical treatment of obesity. Now, for my interest, how many of your programs have or are planning to institute bariatric programs? Okay, so over 50% of the attendees have bariatric programs at their hospital. So this is where the real money is. It is done to treat extreme obesity or, and that is the BMI over 40 or BMI over 35 with medical complications. And as you know, if you've worked with your patients, most people with BMIs over 35 have some medical complications. If they don't have them yet, they will have them soon. And so it's easy to sort of make that happen. When we look at the various options, I think our role as family docs is to understand briefly the surgical options, know what their risks are, know what their success rates, and be able to guide patients who ask our assessment. So they don't go to the one with the slickest advertisement, but perhaps they go to the one that has the most effective surgery for them. So the, the gold standard is the Roux and Y bypass. You can see about 30 cc's of the stomach are closed off by staples, and then they have reanastomosis to the first, uh, about the first 20 centimeters of the jejunum. So that's the standard. Now, how well does this do? It does extremely well. When you're comparing bariatric surgeries, what you need to do is compare the excess weight loss figure. Now, what that means is my actual weight minus my ideal weight, which would be my excess weight, and a percentage of that is the mean excess loss. So Rue and Y typically provides a mean excess weight loss of about 65 to 75%. And check this out, it persists for more than five years. So that's a uh, great success. Perioperative mortality is less than 1%. Of course, supplementations are needed. I'll give you a slide about that. That's a nice resource for your office. And then dumping syndrome secondary to gastric emptying can occur. I would make that stronger. It will occur, and it's actually part of the whole behavioral therapy of bariatric surgery. Vertical band gastroplasty is a similar concept. Uh, but basically they create a pouch. You can see the weight loss is a little less than that, but it does um, persist just as long, so that's good news. The bad news is there's up to a 20% reoperation rate, so that's not so hot, especially given the risk that these patients pose to, to surgery. Um, I was with a cousin, my, my husband's cousin, who had had a uh, vertical band gastroplasty about nine months before, and she was talking about how well she was doing and how successful the surgery had been, and she was quite happy with everything. And we were actually at a social event which involved food, because that's what all of our social events evolve. And she mentioned to me that rice and pasta are a little bit of a problem, but the desserts slide right down. So <laughs> that's the problem with bariatric surgery. It's an easy way to give people results, but most don't really learn how to live differently. Here's gastric banding. This one's really sexy. You know, it's really clever. You sort of have this inflatable little thing. You puff it up if you want to eat less, and you release it if you want to go to a Thanksgiving feast. Again, it's least uh, efficacious, and the re-op rate is pretty significant. So be aware, know what's going on in your community so that we can guide our patients. Now, having said all that, I, would, I have a friend who was a general surgeon who's now an exclusively bariatric surgeon, and he says he's never had patients that are more grateful uh, for his services. So uh, when you find the right patient who is committed, this is truly life-changing surgery. This is a chart you can use in your office. Uh, the best surgical teams typically take care of people for a number of months before their surgery and a number of months after their surgery, by, but by about a year post-op, uh, they're not so interested in the patients anymore and they will come back to our offices. They'll need regular evaluation as far as uh, drug levels and supplementations as noted. So this will be some, a resource that you would want to have in your office. Um, here's the biochemical surveillance survey. You can see every three to six months they should have labs, and then annually after that, uh, what do you check? Of course, lights, sugar, iron studies, ferritin, B12, liver profiles, uh, vitamin D, 
So a full spectrum, because you've changed the fundamental absorption of the GI system. OK, complications. In the first few months post-surgery, vomiting is extremely com uh, common. It has to do with volume, and it has to do with this whole adjustment. Generally, uh, this will clear by six months, but if you do see people during this time, they will be fairly miserable not knowing that this is what laid ahead for them. But most of them will uh, improve. Dumping syndrome is a specific thing related to consumption of foods that are high in sugar. When those move through rapidly and come into the jejunum, there's basically an influx of fluids into the intestines causing a distension and then dumping, as the word says, with nausea, diarrhea, and lightheadedness. It's quite miserable. It's treated by decreasing the pure sugars and also not drinking at the time that you eat. So that clearly is a major behavioral issue. Uh, but having said that, this is the main behavioral feedback that causes people to change because it's not pleasant. And so people begin to learn that if they have a full slice of cake or six cookies, that they'll have dumping syndrome. So then they learn that one cookie maybe would be enough to satisfy that uh, need. What are other complications? We see patients with gallstones. Their drug absorption rates differ. Uh, when they're successful, they are left with excessive skin and might have irritation or infections. And then some develop actually postprandial hypoglycemia. Many patients who had been diabetic or glucose intolerant now return to a more normal metabolism, so they will require significant adjusting of their meds. So that's one of the, that's one of the wonderful adjustments we make. All right, lifestyle changes. As I mentioned, it's behavior modification. What the successful programs really do is teach people to prepare before their surgery. Slower portions, smaller portions, chewing well, stop eating when you're full. Now that's a concept that many have long since forgotten and I think in our land of plenty, we don't even know what it means to be hungry. And then separate your fluids from your solids for at least an hour. Of course, non which are the wonder drug for so many things, are contraindicated when you've had the uh, 